can't um, um, look at the uh, you can't look at the Minnesota River and not talk about its diversity. That's the that's what is you know me is just absolutely amazing is that we have uh, and of course you people are aware of this during the uh, I believe it was '96 they did the uh, river wide uh, sampling or was it '98 I'm not sure which one and we had a total of uh, was it just shy of a hundred species of fish, you know, that are, you may run into within the Minnesota River Basin at some point, or we actually sampled those fish within the basin. A lot of those were found in the trips and whatnot, but that makes them also uh, good candidates for showing up here. And when we do our electrofishing uh, runs, uh, we typically see around between 50 and 60 species total. So again, you know, seeing all that diversity is a big, is a big thing. But, but I think in recent years, the, I'll, I'll call it reemergence of the paddlefish, it has really been exciting. Um, I, I don't know at this point if we can credit it to changes that have occurred within the watershed, or if their, uh, their presence has been simply an effect of higher water levels over the past 20 years. As you get into larger systems, and I and I would say the same thing for the blue sucker, uh, they're they're actually species of relatively somewhat larger systems, and the fact that we're seeing them with a higher frequency within the Minnesota may be just a result of higher floats because you know they need larger habitats and whatnot to to live. So you know I I have no doubt that you know water quality issues have helped as well but certainly water quantity issues have probably been a bigger factor in seeing both the paddlefish, the blue sucker, and the lake sturgeon, which we're seeing also uh, with, with a bit more frequency. So uh, to me, it would be hard to look at, uh, you know, the Minnesota without, you know, again, uh, highlighting that diversity thing. Uh, but I think people genuinely get excited about some of those unusual species. You know, one that, the one that I'm always amazed at uh, shovel no sturgeon. Uh, people think that that is a relatively a newcomer and their numbers are getting higher and whatnot. And the reality is in 1988 is when we actually did one of our first uh, major assessments on the river. And we use gill nets as a sampling tool, we use electrofishing, we use trap netting. And shovel no sturgeon were the most frequently caught fish in the gill nets in 1988. We averaged three shovel nose per lift. Matter of fact, we had one one net that I lifted in a hole uh, in a hole near Sacred Heart that had 30. It was only a hundred foot net, and it had 33 shovel nose surgeon in it. So obviously that biased our final sample, but uh, uh, but a really unique species that has been in the river for a lot of years, and they seem to be holding their own. And I think that's true of a lot of the, the species that are not real common in here. The smallmouth bass, especially. I don't doubt that the trips are contributing. Uh, uh, greatly, especially that lower two to three mile portion of the trips, because they have actually they have quality smallmouth bass habitat. But the fact that those fish are persisting um, over all of the water quality issues that we've dealt with, you know, it, 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 that's a pretty cool thing to hear about and to see. You know that those, that a fish of that quality is still in the system. Like I said yesterday, when we were immediately below the 35W bridge and we had a 19 and 19 inch smallmouth and plus a couple other smallmouths. And then we're at Redwood Falls and we sample young of the year smallmouth. And uh, and actually that's been going on for some time. And again, they seem to be at least hanging on within a system that deals with you know, all sorts of water quality issues.